let's do a little neural anatomy and talk a little bit about function. I'm going to bring this horse model out. That's got some labeling. Some will ignore, but you can always pause it if I don't talk about everything you want to see. And I want to point out the brain. I'm pointing to the word now, but the brain is up here, of course. And the rest of this big column that runs along the backbone is called the spinal cord. That's the two portions I want to center on right now, the brain and spinal cord. We know all the way along it's surrounded by bone, right? The skull surrounds the brain. The vertebral column surrounds the entire spinal cord. When we talk about those two structures, then we're talking about the central nervous system. And here, central is a very important word. The central nervous system, acronym CNS. Then if you talk about all the other nerves, all of them, then you can call that the peripheral nervous system. And I'll put that label over here in the body someplace. So we either have central nervous system or peripheral nervous system. That's one way of classifying the nervous system. Well, if we go back up to the central nervous system, the whole thing has cerebrospinal fluid within it. Cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. And you should know that cerebrospinal fluid, not only being in the central nervous system, but it's also acellular. That's a word that means no cells. So when a spinal tap is performed on a person or a mammal, the fluid that comes out is cerebrospinal fluid, and it should have no cells in it. A couple other words that are worthy to talk about here. Afferent. Afferent is a term. I'm trying to find a parking spot for that. Afferent is a term that means incoming to a point of reference. Now, the point of reference is the central nervous system. So let me show you an afferent nerve. Afferent nerve, let's say, would be in this animal's leg here and carries a message to the central nervous system and then on to the brain. But this nerve that goes carries messages up to the central nervous system would be called an afferent nerve. Basically, those are sensory nerves sending some message to the brain. Now, efferent nerves and I'm trying to find a good parking spot for those, are nerves that carry messages away or outgoing, in this case, in my definition, outgoing from a point of reference. So if the central nervous system is a point of reference, an efferent nerve would come off the spinal cord someplace, go to some, for example, muscle or gland, and cause some action. Now I'd like to show you a diagram that summarizes the taxonomy of the nervous system. You know, taxonomy means a way of classifying. So let's look at this diagram that somebody has produced. And if you look up at the very top, we're talking about the nervous system. Of course, the nervous system, you'll remember, is a fast-acting, short-lived means of communication. It at, rapidly acts, but then the actions are short-lived. Contrast that to the endocrine system, which is relatively show, slow acting, sorry, slow acting, but long lived. Some hormones live for many hours. Back to the diagram. Okay, the nervous system. We can split it into central nervous system and the peripheral here on the right. We just did that. And the central, now I'm back on the left side, contains the brain and the spinal cord. You can read other things with a pause. Peripheral nervous system is divided into motor neurons. Whenever you see the word motor, that mostly refers to causing something to move, like muscles, but it also controls glands in some case. And you should know that motor neurons are efferent neurons. They're carrying messages out of the central nervous system down to a muscle or a gland. Efferent nerves. Sensory nerves, that means you're going to 
carry information from the body, different parts, to the central nervous system. So that's incoming to a point of reference, right? So sensory nerves are afferent nerves, bringing messages, in case this case is nerve impulses or action potentials, which we'll find out later, and the brain interprets those messages. Motor neurons then can be divided into what they really control, like the somatic nervous system. That's basically voluntary movements. The autonomic, because it's automatic, then controls involuntary responses. And those involuntary responses or that system can be further subdivided into sympathetic nervous system, often called the fight or flight system because whether you're going to fight or run it all takes the same uh, processes parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system is often called the rest or digest and then another name is often given to it it's often called the feed or breed system so it controls digestion reproduction, basically things at rest. Okay, now let's get down to a little more detail. The nervous system contains two different types of cells in a broad sense. Neurons, those are very common and they carry action potentials, nerve impulses. But another very important cell found in the nervous system are called glial cells. We're going to find out they're also called neuroglial cells. And they are supporting cells. Without them, the neurons couldn't function. So let's look at a couple diagrams. Here's one. Just says the same thing, but gives a little more explanation. I can cover those up for right now. There you go. Glial cells or neuroglial cells support and protect. They do a lot of work. The neurons, or individually could be called nerve cells, they get information, transmit action potentials, as it's staying here, nerve impulses. And this actually diagram talks about the cell body, which is the soma, another name, and then dendrites, which tend to get the input from other neurons, and then the axons, which tend to carry messages away from the cell body. That's all diagrammed here. And let me move that out of the way and get one other diagram that shows this. And I really like this one because it shows the glial cells interacting with the nervous system, whereas the other one just listed them separately and showed them separate. OK, <clears throat> whoever made this was showing, was using the analogy of, you know, sending a message from Boston to New York and also to Philadelphia. And that's a great analogy because one neuron can talk to different places. And I want to point out the glial cell. Well, maybe I should point out the gold colored neuron. Okay. So anything gold in this diagram, gold colored, is a neuron. So here's the whole neuron, here's the dendrite cell body, and then this long thing is called the axon. And then over here, we're going to talk about synapse later, but that's where two neurons talk to each other. And you should know it's only one-way communication there. This axon would talk to this dendrite on the neuron and never backwards. Anyway, the glial cells are everything else. They're in blue in this case. They're in red over here. I like this diagram because it shows these neuroglial cells putting insulation material around the axon, which we're going to name in a little bit. OK, I'm just going to point out a few things on this table. You can pause it and read it, take notes, whatever. But I like this because it shows five different types of neuroglial cells, which makes the good point that there are many types. What do they do? They surround axons and they're actually insulation and they form the myelin sheath. There's other axons that help the uh, myelin sheath as well and central axons in this case. There are other neuroglial cells that form the blood-brain barrier. 
that might be a concept you should know. It's often abbreviated three capital B's in a row, BBB, the blood-brain barrier. It helps protect the brain from many chemicals. Uh, let's see, one other thing here is some of the glial cells are phagocytic. That means they're going to be in the brain and eat things that might get to the brain. That's foreign material or really material that might have aged and is no longer functional. And finally, you know, not for the squeezy stomachs, but I want to show you an isolated nervous system from a human. And I'll make it small right there for a moment just to orientate you. This is the nervous system of a human that's been dissected away from all the bone. It doesn't show every nerve because the tiny ones would get lost, but orientate you up here is cranio, of course. There's the brain, and you can see the two eyeballs. And those eyeballs are connected to the brain by the optic nerves. And then leaving the brain, we have the spinal cord, and it goes down here. And then everything else that's on this white table would be called the peripheral nervous system. So I'm highlighting the central nervous system, which is the spinal cord and then the brain. But it's a very good illustration. And I'll enlarge it here a little bit so you can see things further. But it's just a great diagram. It's an actual specimen. There's certain ways to process this tissue so the nerves remain but it's a great little diagram to show you all the main nerves and like, for example, spinal nerves that are branching off.